Okay, we're back. We're back here with Mina Marco and me on Monday about energy. There's a, there's a rhyme and an alliteration and everything in there. Uh, welcome to the show, Marco. Nice to have you here. Well, it's, uh, it's always one enchanted afternoon when I get to reconnect with my good buddy Jay Fidel, and I'm not in <laughs> Hanoi this time. I'm actually in a place that starts with an H, which is uh, Hilo, which is also a wonderful place to be. We have a lot of places in Hawaii that start with H. <laughs> well, when you have an alphabet of only 12 letters and H happens to be one of the 12 letters, I think that kind of goes with the territory. It happens, yeah. By the way, we didn't discuss this in advance, but... Uh, what do you think about the solar impulse? They, they set down in, uh, what is it, Dayton, Ohio now, which is where the Wright brothers came from. There's something symbolic about that. They're doing pretty well, aren't they? Well, those two Swiss pilots, Andre and Bertrand, I think, are having a grand old time uh, continuing their trek now that they uh, have gotten over their battery problem, which grounded them, geez, grounded them for eight or nine months here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it seems like they're winging their way to their final destination, which is, uh, I believe it was... Um, Abu Dhabi, I think, or the Emirates, where they actually started. So, uh, you know, let's let's hear it for for solar powered uh, flight. Well, it's it's the beginning of a new time because if they can do it, somebody else can do it better. And before you know it, uh, it will be the Wright brothers all over again, except without any gas. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's talk about uh, Vietnam for a moment before we get on to local things. Um, and you spent some time there, and you have some observations. Uh, first, about the the, uh, uh, the Tonkin Gulf and about uh, what is it, wind in the Tonkin Gulf. Uh, wh what did you notice? What have you read? Well, I've I've really been kind of glued to the news over the past few days, Jay, because uh, amongst other reasons, uh, President Obama arrived in Hanoi uh, in the past 24 hours, and his uh, this is part of his Asia trip where he'll be going to Hanoi, which is the capital of Vietnam in the northern part of the country, and then traveling to uh, Ho Chi Minh City in the south, also known mostly to the locals as Saigon, former Saigon. And then he goes from there to uh, to Japan. I think it's just two countries, if I'm not mistaken. And the, the big news being that the president announced the end of the long-time arms embargo against uh, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam because they're, interestingly, one of the few countries in the world that is still ruled by, by the Communist Party, but they call themselves the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, or SRV. And this is uh, really, really big news amongst uh, a number of news uh, uh, announcements from Obama's visit, including, and I think you'll appreciate this, that the uh, U.S. Peace Corps is now going to be going back to Vietnam after a multi-decades-long absence going back to, uh, to teach English, and I see that as very, very good news, because uh, I'm a big believer in, in Kennedy's dream, just, uh, John F. Kennedy's dream of the Peace Corps, and for what it can do for people uh, in developing countries. And then finally, part of the deal was the announcement that uh, General Electric uh, Wind Division uh, is apparently receiving a contract to move forward with as many as 1,000 megawatts worth of wind energy uh, off the coast of Vietnam, which is a fairly rich area. So, you know, my time there, uh, which was a little over a week, I was really struck by the dynamism of, of this country, the fact that they've grown, uh, essentially doubled the population since the end of the war, 1975. They're, all, they're about 90 million right now. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And even though they're ruled by the Communist Party, it's still uh, kind of a hybrid uh, market uh, and, uh, and and planned economy with more probably more and more towards the market side. So there's a lot of movement in, in Vietnam, and one of the things I was really struck by is the fact that uh, the overall sentiment uh, that I picked up is that they're overwhelmingly pro-American, even despite the very uh, kind of tortured and violent history between the United States and Vietnam over the past uh, 60, 70 years, uh, and yet, uh, you know, here they were supported during the course of their war against the, uh, first against the French uh, after the end of World War II and the defeat of the French in 54, and then the Americans got involved until 75. They were supported during that time by their neighbors to the north, the People's Republic of China, and yet the overwhelming sentiment that I picked up is, uh, is a fair amount of uh, suspicion and hostility towards their large northern neighbors. So mm -hmm. the, the, the fact that 
the president announced this arms embargo ending is is really really big deal in terms of the overall strategic chessboard in the region, uh, especially regarding uh, the South China Sea, what the Chi- what the Vietnamese refer to not as the South China Sea but simply the East Sea. They omit the China part, the East Sea. <laughs> so the fact that you'll have uh, the uh, Americans much more involved in Vietnam in a very tangible way in terms of foreign investment, American investment, and uh, what appears to be the very likely possibility that American naval ships will be able to return after decades of absence return to one what was uh, long ago one of the largest American naval bases on the planet, which is at Cameron Bay, which is in central Vietnam right on the coast there. So this, uh, even though the Chinese foreign ministry is playing this very very kind of muted saying, well, we support, we support the ending of any embargo such as that, it, it has to be clearly seen as very, very bad news by Beijing because the, the Vietnamese uh, have this long coastline uh, right uh, obviously next to the East Sea or, or South China Sea, and the fact that the Americans are going to become uh, much more involved uh, with Vietnam cannot be seen as, as, as anything but rather bad news. From, from China's perspective. Yeah, it sounds like your trip was really productive in that way. But what I get at what you said, I mean, is I think uh, Obama is doing some really good things. I mean, Cuba, for example, and now this, good foreign policy, good soft power. And to go a step further, um, you know, bringing the, uh, the Peace Corps back uh, into, you know, into that area, very valuable. Of course, valuable for them, but it's also valuable for us as a matter of soft power and diplomatic related good foreign policy. Um, it's also valuable, I think, for the country. And my, my view for a long time is, is uh, that our, our young people uh, don't have a national service. Uh, in the absence of the draft, there's very few things they can do to connect with the federal government. So you have several generations, several generations of young people in this country who had never done national service and who don't feel connected to the country, except to criticize it and to, uh, you know, pay taxes and not like paying taxes. So this is an example of the Peace Corps being resurrected. And then, frankly, I think um, it's good on every side of it. And hopefully there'll be more resurrection of the Peace Corps in other areas in the world. Uh, the big question, however, is whether the next president will follow through on this kind of soft power, this kind of good foreign policy. We'll have to see about that. But it's nice that you saw it when you were there. You know, an interesting twist about the Peace Corps, I don't know you're probably aware of this, Jay, but actually to get into the Peace Corps is actually a very competitive process. It's not as if, oh, I'm going to join the Peace Corps today and, and you're just kind of immediately, uh, you can me- immediately accepted in the program. There's a fair amount of vetting that goes on. I don't know how competitive it's become, but it, it's, uh, it, it is quite competitive. Uh, you know, they're looking for, for people, for young Americans typically, and there are also older Americans who get involved with the Peace Corps who, uh, who, who have a very strong dedication, who bring tangible skills to, to, to the country that they're going to be in for several years. So you know, I, I heartily agree. I think it's a, it's a wonderful example of American soft power, and it, it has, uh, can have a huge impact both on the people on the receiving end and also for those Peace Corps volunteers whose, whose lives can be dramatically changed and enriched by their time in country wherever they happen to be. So I think it's just great. Yeah. All emissaries... All, um, you know, diplomatic people, uh, all representing the United States, they have to do it right. Anyway, so let's move on to energy. Uh, and I suppose the, you know, the 800-pounder these days is, as it has been, the PUC's decision on the next era docket. Um, so there's been some stuff in the paper uh, recently by way of an edi- editorial and an article uh, over, uh, you know, the possibilities of what the PUC might do uh, in its decision, which is due, well, technically on June 3rd, week, week after this. Um, so I guess, uh, what, are the, what has the paper been saying, Marco, and how do you feel about it? Well, there's, there's been a lot of what I'll kind of characterize as rather heavy breathing going on, Jay, as we get closer to, uh, to June 3rd. And again, just to, to, for clear for all the, the listeners and viewers, June 3rd is, is the kind of official uh, expiration date of the merger agreement between Hawaiian Electric Industries and uh, Juneau Beach, Florida-based uh, Next Era Energy. And both the applicants, and all the rest of us for that matter as well, both, uh, but especially the applicants are, 
very interested in getting a decision by June 3rd, and uh, Chairman Randy Awase a number of weeks ago said, well, it may be possible, but essentially don't hold your breath. You know, we'll still follow our, our own due diligence timeline here, but from what some of my sources tell me that they are, uh, the folks at the commission are kind of burning the midnight oil to try to come to a decision as, as soon, but not, not rushed, uh, of course, but as soon as possible. And one of the corollary effects uh, on, on the, the, the negative side, in, a lot, in my opinion, is that it's just taken up so much oxygen in the room the merger has at the commission that they uh, have not been able to dedicate the time and, and effort and resources to a number of other pressing issues as well. So uh, I think everybody agrees that you know, the sooner that there's a decision, the better. Now, what happens if there's not a decision by June 3rd? Does it all collapse? Well, I'm probably not. I'm you know, kind of channeling for, for uh, the, the brain trust that next year that if there is no de- decision by June 3rd, what's their motivation to, to call it? call it quits and go back to Florida. I, I think, you know, they've they got to stick with it, most likely, and it's in their best interest to stick with it for at least another month uh, or until the end of June when uh, Commissioner Mike Champley's term formally ends, and then the speculation is, uh, well, the, the governor's made clear publicly that he's not going to reappoint Mike for uh, another six-year term. Then the question is, does he have somebody uh, ready to 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 announce uh, sometime in June uh, that will uh, take Mike's place as early as the uh, first day or two of July, or does he have Mike continue as a holdover appointment? So, so there's just uh, you know, many, many levels of... It gets complicated. Because I mean, if he doesn't hold him over, I mean, I don't know, holding over, is that, they do that? Um, and if he doesn't hold him over and appoints somebody else, the somebody else hasn't been at all these hearings, hasn't heard all this testimony. How could exactly. that person actually vote on something like this? Um, you know, I, it, does, it doesn't have the ring. It doesn't, doesn't lend public confidence to the administration of justice. It makes it look mm, questionable. And so uh, it's in the best interest of the PUC to do this by June 3rd, for sure. And not by Ju- June 30th, by June 3rd. And if they don't do it, you know, by June 30th, I think it's really going to be a mess. Um, the other thing is, uh, let, me, let me just comment on your, your thought. I mean, it's, yes, it's possible that, uh, that the parties will hang around after the June 3rd deadline. As I recall, that, if, um, that, that deadline allows, if, if that deadline passes without a decision, it means either one of them could back out of the deal without penalty. And so, um, you know, there's something to be said for the possibility that they will back out of the deal without penalty. Uh, for who knows what has changed under the hood. But uh, it also seems to me that, um, uh, that we can't exclude the possibility that they will back out. And if I were the PUC, I couldn't exclude the possibility that they will back out. And if that happens, then it's kind of on the head of the PUC for having you know, set up things, failed to meet that deadline, and let the whole thing collapse without even uttering a word. Um, I think it's really in the interest of the PUC to make a ruling by June 3rd. The question then is um, conditions. And uh, I wonder if you could, um, you know, give me your thoughts on, on the article in the paper about, in the editorial for that matter, um, on uh, the, the conditions that, additional conditions that may be required here and whether that's appropriate in the circumstances. Now, it's a really critical question, Jay, and, and what you're referring to, there was an editorial by the editorial board of the Star Advertiser yesterday and the Sunday. Honolulu Star Advertiser, and essentially the gist of it was that Nextera hasn't met the bar as far as being the best choice uh, at this time to take over Hawaiian Electric Industries and Eco, Helco, and Miko, and that in order to, uh, to, to get it over the bar, so to speak, they need to provide additional commitments. That's kind of the, the operative word, is commitments. And there are already, gosh, by my count, I think there are 95, at least uh, according to Nextera's count, 95 commitments that they have made, the original 85, and then they came up with 10 more, if I'm not mistaken, when they essentially cut a side deal with the uh, U.S. Department of Defense in late November. So the advertiser's editorial board's position was they need to come up with more commitments. And uh, 
that shows to me kind of a, an ignorance of, of how the game is played at the commission that at this point uh, it is not possible, not, uh, not, not kosher, to have next year a provided additional 2, 10, 20, 50, however many more commitments. And in fact, uh, after the DOD commitments, uh, the additional commitments to the end of November, early December, uh, Chairman Randy Awase, in a rather strongly and heated uh, uh, decision, actually was a dissent uh, against the other two, Lorraine Akiba and Mike Champley, who voted essentially to allow these additional commitments uh, into the, the record uh, as part of the DOD deal. Uh, Randy very strenuously objected and essentially said, uh, this is not horse trading. This is not politics. You gave us the best and final offer, and yet you come back and you add sweeteners to the deal, and essentially the subtext, if not explicit text, was don't you dare do that again. So it is not in the place of, uh, it's not in the, the place for next era to, to add any more commitments at this point. So, again, it shows to me kind of an ignorance on the part of the editorial writer as far as... Uh, what is and is not possible in a regulatory framework at this stage in the game. Now, the, the, you know, the parlor betting is, is hot and heavy amongst those of us who are watching this very carefully, which there's no shortage, but especially amongst the interveners, and not to mention the applicants. Of which you are but, one. Well, we're, yes, the Hawaii Island Energy Cooperative is one of the, uh, one of the, has been one of the interveners. There are 25 left. We started with 20, 29, a number of dropped out, and now we're officially down to 25, including the consumer advocate and the two other state agencies. So there's been a lot of speculation about uh, what the likely scenarios are and, and the likely scenarios are the possible. Let's look at the range of possible scenarios, and I only count three of them. Don't, don't tell me. Uh, don't tell me the three scenarios. We're going to take a short break. I want it to be a cliffhanger, okay? <laughs> we come okay. back from this break, we're going to hear Marco's possible scenarios on the PUC's decision in the next era docket. We'll be right back. You'll see. Aloha. My name is Justina Spiritu, and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers, including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Mahalo. Okay, we're back. We're live. Now we have Mina Marita on the line. We have Michael Mangelsdorf on the line. And I'm Jay Fidel here in Honolulu, and they join us by Skype audio in various places. Where are you, Mina? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You're not still in Germany, right? No, I got back last week, um, Sunday. Okay. Mina gave a speech in, uh, in Germany about energy. Um, Mina, just to refresh you, we're talking about the next era deal, and Marco, uh, before the break, had uh, a cliffhanger of three possible scenarios that he wanted to describe. So, uh, Marco, what are those scenarios? Everybody has been waiting to hear about it. Well, uh, perhaps Mina can add a fourth or, the f or a fifth, but the three that I come up with are, number one, approval of, as is of the, the deal as proposed with the, uh, the X number of commitments that are on the table. So essentially approval as proposed. Second would be uh, not approving what's proposed, either by a two-to-one vote, uh, a majority vote, or a three-to-nothing vote. The third being approval with, with conditions uh, or stipulations. And my bet would be, if, if I was putting money on this, I think it's highly unlikely that there would be 
an approval as proposed uh, uh, without any additional stipulations or conditions. I think that's the least likely of the scenarios. But just to be clear, though, that, that approval and that alternative possibility would include acceptance of all the additional promises that NextEra made, right? Uh, uh, 95 to start with. Why does that remind me of Luther and the, the 95 thesis back, <laughs> back when? Uh, plus the additional ones that they made in what, dealing with the government on a government agreement. So it was, it was 105, that's even better than Luther. Um, and um, uh, that would be included, right? If you see, when you line out that possibility, and you describe that possibility of acceptance, uh, the PUC would be accepting all of the conditions that have been proposed uh, by NextEra, right? The commitments, they're co yeah, the, yeah. Not, it's a different C word, is commitments, and yes. I believe they're, they're 95, yes, so that would be accepting those commitments as being sufficient, as being sufficient to, yeah. to approve the deal with nothing additional. Yeah. The, the second possibility being approval with conditions, the conditions coming from the commission, the third being uh, out, like I said, outright rejection of the deal without any conditions. And, uh, you know, Mina, I'll certainly be interested to hear what she has to say on this, but I've been given a lot of thought to the option that a lot of people seem to think is the most likely, which is approval with conditions. And that just seems to me to be, not only is it something that uh, next year I warned explicitly against or warned the commission not to go down that path, citing uh, precedent and case law, but it seems to me that if the commission were to come up with its own conditions, that that makes things incredibly messy. And then, then if if next year or the applicants decide they accept half of them or three quarters of them or one, or one quarter of them, then are they in effect? Who are they negotiating with? They're negotiating with the commission on these conditions that the commission came up with, and and there's going to be a role or or no role for the consumer advocate or for the rest of the interveners for that matter. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a regulatory historian by any means, but uh, it just seems to me that the commission coming up with, with one or more stipulations just makes things, uh, the potential to make things very, very messy. Well, let me, uh, add, a, let me add a thought on that, is if they do that, you're, you're right. I mean, does that create another level of negotiation here? How, do you, how does NextEra negotiate with that? And then, of course, you've got, you know, all the interveners out there who have thoughts about it. Um, so uh, that, that could get very messy, and um, I really wonder if it's a good idea. But you said earlier that um, although Randy uh, Iwase uh, didn't like the idea of uh, these conditions being negotiated, uh, horse trading, as you put it, or as he put it, um, uh, the other two commissioners uh, are perhaps more inclined to, uh, to, to negotiate and horse trade on these things. So could it be that they would override him? Is that, is that where we are, that the two might override the chair? Is that possible? Well, I think now's the perfect time for Mina to give us her, her studied uh, insight because <laughs> she's, 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 of course, the, been at the, 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 at the big table and played this game at the highest level. So you I'm, I'm waiting with hey, bated breath. all waiting, Mina. Mina. <laughs> You know, on, on, on negotiation, you know, there's nothing in statute that precludes negotiation, and at times it's, it's encouraged to bring the parties together. And um, the fact that the administration refused to negotiate, that's, you know, again, I think they did the public a disservice when they couldn't bring... Um, something back to the commission between the administration and and the um, uh, and the applicant. And um, so, you know, I, I, I think there are a lot of lost opportunities here because what we're trying to do is massage something that is in the, the best interest of all parties, you know, and, and um, you know, uh, you know, we, like I said earlier, I, I think that was a lost opportunity on behalf of the administration. Yeah. But, but um, you know, what about now? What about now? I mean, how, I, I just don't understand what the mechanics would be for the commission. I mean, do you see it as possible? Is it, and is there a precedent for uh, this commission, the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, 
to determine on their own, based on input or no input from others, because there are, of course, plenty of other other proposed conditions from a number of the interveners uh, to, to, to make uh, approval possible. But, I mean, do you see that at this point in the game, possible, plausible, and defensible that the commission would come up with their list with a list of their own conditions that they would say okay if you jump through these hoops we will approve and and what would come after that if they were to go down that path sure i mean they're their judicatory body <laughs> you know as long as they follow the process i mean they're the final decision maker you know they ask their own set of uh, questions you know they they the commission also helped to develop the record. So, you know, there's nothing that precludes the commission from coming up with their own conditions um, in, in should they decide to approve. You know, they don't have to be totally reliant on the party. Yeah, but let me ask you this, you know. Suppose they come up with, the commission comes up with additional conditions. And, um, you know, uh, Nextera is not willing to do some of it, okay, some yeah. of it. Now, I suppose Nextera has options at that point. One is they can say, thanks, but no thanks, we're out of here. They could say, well, yeah. we, we accept all these additional conditions. And third, they could say we accept some of them, but not all of them. Uh, now you have yeah. less trading. Now, now that gets a little complicated, doesn't it? Right, so they can go back to the commission to reconsider. I mean, let's say... So if there's an approval with conditions, there's two scenarios there. One, that the conditions are acceptable to um, Hawaiian Electric and Nextera, and fine and dandy and everybody moves forward. And then the second scenario is, you know, approval with conditions, but the conditions may not be acceptable to the applicant. Um, one of the things that they can probably do is ask the commission to reconsider, and if um, and if that the commission does not reconsider, um, you know there could be a possible appeal on those conditions to the intermediate court of appeals. Or oh, they can terminate the deal. I don't think it terminate the deal completely. Well, why, why couldn't but, they? I mean, for example, the commission comes up with, um, you know, two conditions, one of which is acceptable and the oh. other is not. So next era re moves to reconsider uh, that yeah. decision. Uh, the reconsideration is granted, fine, then we have a deal. Uh, the reconsideration mm -hmm. is not granted, next era says, enough, I had enough, I'm leaving, goodbye. Uh, why can't yeah, they, that's, why that's can't they walk away from the deal? Yeah, they can walk away from the deal. I think after that too. I mean, you know, if the if the conditions they find they find to be too onerous or or um, not um, not within the scope yeah. of the regulatory proceeding. Well, um, let me ask you guys. You've been involved in you know you've watched the pleadings. You've watched the emergence and um, you know the development of these ninety five plus uh, conditions. Um, commitment. What what other conditions could there be? I mean, we could we could make ten thousand conditions. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that's really constructive. Isn't the best uh, alternative for the PUC right now to accept or reject and get on with it one way or the other? And in fact, let me put it this way: is it, with all of these commitments and all of the capital that will mm -hmm. come in and all the benefits that will be visited in terms of technology and resources to the you know largest utility in the state, isn't the best course for the, the benefit of the consumer and the state to simply say, okay, we'll take all your conditions, let's do the deal. Isn't that the best course for the PUC, honestly? Probably because the PUC is still the regulator. You know? Right, they can regulate I mean, them afterward. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. People forget that they have ongoing authority here. It doesn't end with approval or disapproval. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, and, and again, usually in these proceedings, you know, the, the regulatory standard is fit, willing, and able. Right. And I don't think there's any question that they're fit, willing, and able. I don't think there's any question they would bring huge value to the state, huge investment. 
I mean, it seems so obvious. And, and I also think that the, the reasons for all this protest are not particularly good reasons. I think, you know, well, I've said what I think. What do you think, Marco? Well, I, I, I'm still kind of puzzled as to uh, mechanically, in a, in a procedural fashion, how it would go down if the commission were to come up with stipulations, conditions to their approval, and how things would go from there as far as if some of them were acceptable and others were not, uh, would negotiation take place directly between the applicants and the commission? And what role, if any, would the consumer advocate and the rest of us, the other 20-plus interveners, what role would we have to be able to chime in on the, the negotiations or the, the process, the discussion, of, of essentially the New Deal? Well, that's a good question for you, Mina. What role? Uh, or is it a fait accompli uh, after they have a direct negotiation with the commission? Well, I think this... I, 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 again, it comes down to the decision, right? And so the decision is between the applicants and the PUC. So uh, while they may allow the parties to comment, basically everybody has filed their final position, and it's, it, it's you know, it's between the decision maker and the applicant at that point. I mean, that's how I see it. And... And then again, if the decision um, maker and the applicant can't resolve it, the applicant has the ability to appeal the decision in the court. And I guess everybody can participate in that by filing amicus brief. What I, what I hear you saying, though, Mina, is that um, if um, there's negotiation, direct negotiation between the PUC, I mean, that can happen. There can be direct negotiation with the PUC and NextEra, and for that matter, Hawaiian that, Electric. And and when that and happens, uh, they the your, at your that point, at that point, it's not negotiation. You know, the, the, if the conditions once the, the PUC puts forth the condition, I mean, it's a decision and order, and I, I think it's you know at that point you decide whether the conditions are reasonable. And the challenge to that is an appeals process. So it's kind of take it or leave it. That's what I hear you saying. That's what I hear you saying. On the part of the applicants, it's 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 not negotiable. But but what about you know what about the power of the the commission to assign things to mediation or arbitration? Uh, Is the commission you know it it sounds very you know mm, judicial what you're describing rather than quasi judicial. Isn't there an opportunity right. for somebody to say, hey, let's just get in a room on this? Well, I, I, again, you know, the, the applicant, if they find the conditions um, not acceptable to them, um, I, again, they can, they can move to reconsider, and, and that's what it is. It's, it's a quasi-judicial process. Yeah. Well, you know, that's one so, of the reasons that I'm, from my point of view, I'm... I'm concerned about additional conditions here because I think they complicate things. And I take uh, Mina's point uh, that, you know, uh, that, that you can always regulate a utility. So therefore, the most uh, effective practical solution here is to accept or reject. In my, my view, uh, I would accept. And then uh, if there are issues that are left over, they can be regulated. Um, the mm-hmm. power of the Public Utilities Commission is enormous. Sometimes it doesn't really implement that power, but it could, it, it could and should implement uh, its power as, as the PUC uh, in any uh, uh, transaction like this after the transaction is done. So to extend these proceedings, um, to have this um, you know, judicial type uh, order and appeal process, uh, sort of an in public you know, judicial negotiation, seems to me counterproductive. Marco? Oh, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty kind of head spinning to me, uh, and I, I'm just curious whether you, uh, the two of you, know of any any precedent uh, kind of similar uh, in scope and magnitude over the past decades, where a a merger, change of control, has taken place has been within the commission's uh, purview, uh, where they have. Uh, 
come up with uh, stipulations to, or conditions to their approval. I mean, can you can you go back and cite any precedent uh, uh, where they've done this in the past? Well, I, I don't know of any specifics, but probably um, probably the Kauai metric, um, KIUC acquisition. Um, but uh, that might not be similar because there was something negotiated between the consumer advocate and the applicant that they brought to the PUC. But, you know, in the first application for KIUC, it was an outright rejection. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, it was because it was uh, too high a purchase price, you know, pushing somewhere shy of $300 million, which was deemed by the commission at the time to be too great a burden, financial burden, to the new KIUC if they were to approve that deal. And then the, uh, the deal uh, price was reduced to uh, the $215 million range, which was accepted by the PUC. No, I, I, I think it wasn't so much of a burden, but I think there was some um, question about the um, the value the, um, the the value of the utility. You know, this is this all reminds me of what happened in the, the two uh, Time Warner mergers that have come up in the past year. One is Comcast, where there were apparently mm -hmm. some decisions um, between. Uh, between the FCC um, and the uh, and uh, Comcast, w which led to Comcast withdrawal of its application, an agreement was reached by which it would yeah. withdraw the application, and there had to be some well, contact between the yeah. agency and the applicant at that point. The other the other one just happened, and that's Charter Communications, um, and that was a deal where the FCC uh, granted the application with conditions. So I think it's a matter of administrative law, at least at the national level. And probably in other states, you know, for uh, for precedent, uh, although the statutes may differ, seems to me that well, conditions I, are an appropriate methodology. Yeah, there, there's, and you know, there are smaller um, acquisitions that have happened with um, water companies, private water companies here, where and just recently where the PUC approved with conditions. Um, I'm not sure how the Hawaiian shell acquisitions went, if there were specific conditions in that, because that was more than a decade ago. But, you know, locally, within the PUC jurisdiction, just some uh, water companies. Okay, well, it just so happens that uh, we have another show on this on the 6th. That would be three days after the 3rd of June. <clears throat> so I hope we can get together and uh, and talk about what happened because that'll be a really watershed, uh, you know, date and event. But well, let me if I could mm -hmm. ask, if I could just ask Brina, uh, Mina briefly, what uh, whether your uh, your 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 insight, your connections, uh, your intel uh, gives you uh, how much confidence to believe in whether a decision will be forthcoming a week from this Friday. I have no intel. <laughs> I find that hard to believe. How about a wild guess? How about a wild guess, Mina? <laughs> uh, a guess? I don't know. I just, you know, sometimes, sometimes I throw my hands up in the air and I say, you know, I'm not going to worry over things that I cannot control. <laughs> Okay, we have a few and minutes I, left, and, and I would and like to address the. Uh, I would like to address the the recent um, uh, report or uh, announcement by Hawaiian Electric of uh, some of the elements in the plan that it is designing, which will be uh, released in August, uh, pursuant to the requirement of the PUC. And uh, among the items in the, in their uh, you know their their sort of early expectations for that plan were uh, wind. Um, I mean, I, I guess utility scale wind, um, undersea cables that deliver the wind on the notion that you can't reach, you can't reach, um, you know, the 100% goal unless you exchange uh, energy among the islands. Um, uh, building a grid for, I think, $350 million uh, and uh, integrating uh, LNG as a, as a bridge fuel. Those are the things I think they mentioned. 
Uh, any comments on their comments on what the elements of the plan that they uh, talked about in anticipation of the, the formal plan they're supposed to file in August? Well, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not, this is a direct, I mean, this, okay, there's the PSIP, but there's also studies that have been done and, and optimiz optimization models run um, by other entities than, the, than Hawaii Electric. And, um, you know, these optimization models show that Getting to 100% affordably requires some utility scale projects. And, uh, and so I think we need to understand that we're not going to get to 100% by distributed energy or, or high reliance on solar. Um, I, I think the other critical issue here is, you know, there's all this talk about storage and how storage is going to be the game changer, but storage is expensive. And if we want to get to, um, if we want to be able to integrate more renewables sooner, one of the things that we have to look at is flexible generation. And, and so, you, you know, you have to look at the HECO fleet and and move towards some smaller, more um, flexible generators. And as we move in that direction, really, well, what are the fuels that are, are price competitive, efficient, and cleaner that will get us in that direction? And, you know, a lot of times that points back to LNG. So, you know, as we talk about the plan in general, I mean, these are things that we need to be thinking about that, um, you know, while we are advocating for 100% renewable, we're also mixing all the, all the key um, elements that can get us there faster and more cost-effectively. Mina, we're almost out of time, and let me, I'd like to give the last minute to Marco. Marco, what, what are your thoughts about uh, HECO's announcement? Well, let me go there by, by recounting one of the more kind of famous, iconic uh, scenes from a 1967 film, it's a favorite of mine, Cool Hand Luke, with Paul Newman. And uh, what we have here is failure to communicate. And what I mean by that is it's just kind of striking to me that you have two dramatically different directions regarding liquefied natural gas. You have the governor who has made his opposition very, very clear, along with the support of folks uh, such as Blue Planet Foundation and others that are dead set against LNG. And then yet you've got on the other side uh, the Hawaiian Electric Companies uh, with uh, Nextera in its corner, at least for now, that are going full speed ahead want to go full speed ahead with LNG. So uh, there, there just seems to me this kind of kabuki dance of, of major power players in the state, uh, pun intended, that are on uh, opposite sides of the field here in terms of uh, a very, very important decision and a very important energy decision, economic decision for our state. And, and they're talking past each other because they have very different views of how uh, the, the, the state is going to move towards the accepted goal of 100% uh, of, uh, renewable for power generation. So I'm just, I'm struck by, by the, the failure to communicate here. There's just okay, well, it sounds like the PUC will have to decide that one too, and that will be a major decision. It will be based on whatever final plan is uh, submitted in, uh, in August and they, it'll rest on their desk. So the PUC has two major decisions to make here in the next uh, few months. Thank you so much, both of you. Here. Sorry, Marco? That was Mina. Oh, that was Mina. No, they, they have a lot of major decisions to, be, to make, more than two. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, we'll cover them all, right? The three of us, right? 
Uh, but, but for now, we're out of time. Uh, that's uh, Mina Marina, uh, former chair of the PUC, uh, Marco Mangelsdorf, president of uh, Sol Solar, uh, Prohibition Solar in Hilo, Hawaii. Thank you so much, as always, you guys. I really appreciate it. Two weeks hence, we'll be back. There'll be much more then. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you.